Hi, Grace. Hey, Ohenya. Well, how have you been? Well, I've been... it's been a long time since the last time that we record. We've been a bit busy, and Chris had been sick, to be precise. And mm-hmm. so that's the reason why we took a bit longer to do this episode. Yeah, well, I'm back in the land of the living now, so yeah, we <laughs> present to you the fourth episode of A History of Evil Men, and a bit of a different tone to today's episode. What are we talking about, Anya? As we already decided that we are going to focus on crimes that happen in Argentina, New Zealand, or Australia, this is our next Argentinian episode. It's going to be on a very sad case of murder that actually on February of this year, it was the 20th anniversary of this crime. We are going to be talking about the kidnap and murder of Natalia Melman in Argentina, in Miramar. Natalia Melman was born the 13th of March of 1986 in Buenos Aires, Argentina. She was the daughter of Laura Calampuca and Gustavo Melman, and she had three siblings. Noel, Nicolás, and Laura. So they were born originally in Buenos Aires, but when Natalia was young still, they decided to move to Miramar. Do you know the nickname of Miramar? I believe you did tell me, but it does now slip my mind. The City of Children. Yes. I mean, it's reported that the family wanted to have a change of lifestyle. They wanted to gear down a little bit and... uh, you know, take some time away from the busy hustle and bustle of... Uh, the big city, yeah. hoping to find a quiet place to raise their children. Mm. And things turned out to be very different at the end, didn't they? Yes, Grace. unfortunately. Natalia's family and friends describe her as a friendly, solidary, and romantic girl. They came from a working-class family, and she would often help as a waitress working in her parents' bar. So on the night of February the 3rd, 2001, Natalia went out to the boliches like most teenagers do. Mm -hmm. She was 15 at that time. And it is said that she was looking forward to meeting her ex-boyfriend, a boy called Maximiliano Marolt, in the hopes of um, coming back. With her boyfriend, like... Yeah, I mean, she wanted to reconcile, but, uh, yeah, unfortunately didn't end up that way. Um, The couple did seem to reconcile. It seems like Maximiliano was already dating another girl, so when Natalia and her friends found him in the boliche Amadeus, boliche is how we call the nightclubs in Spanish, Mm -hmm. so when she found herself with Maximiliano, finally... He was with another girl, apparently dating another girl. But he was also in company of an older man that will become very important further mm. in the story. Somewhat of a unfortunate uh, linchpin in the in the whole events. So witness, because keep in mind that Miramar was a quite small city. At that time, it had barely... Um, 8,000 inhabitants, even though it was and it still is a very popular place for people to go on the summer because it's on the Argentinian coast. Mm -hmm. So neighbors and witnesses would later say that Natalia went back, I mean, she left the boliche at 6 or 7 a.m. and she started walking by herself back to her house. But the thing is, Natalia never got to arrive to her house. On that same day, Natalia's family went straight away to the police. Uh, yeah, to make a missing persons report because it was extremely unlikely for her to just... Leave not- her home and not tell anything to her parents. And the fact that they had called around and tried to find where she was or who she might have gone... And it was later discovered that the uh, person who she was introduced to by Maximilian... 
in that night. That night was a man known as Gustavo Fernandez or El Gallo. And um, he had a criminal record. Criminal record, but was yes. also known as a an, an informer and uh, a had had ties to the police. He had ties to yeah. the police. Mm. But so far we know that he had a um, criminal record for petty crime, stealing, that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, but when the parents, Laura and Gustavo, went straight away to the police, they tried to, they basically insinuated or told the parents that her daughter was just another teenage runaway, mm. even though there were no reasons for her to just abandon her place. Mm-hmm. Like you said, it was not not something that she would do. And even so, a 15-year-old, mm. a child, like adults can get lost. I mean, you can, yep. but not an adolescent. No. And, you know, the fact that she didn't plan, it didn't seem that she planned ahead for a, uh, mm-hmm. a uh, to run away. She didn't take any uh, any bags, any extra clothes, you know, no extra shoes or jewelry or anything. No reason to believe that yep. she was that she, that she had escaped. She had run away. She literally dropped everything and bolted after going out clubbing all night. Which, yeah, which I don't think. So. No, <laughs> no, that sounds about as yeah feasible never. as you know as as you think it is. The search for Natalia. And basically all this process, this long and painful process of seeking justice Mm -hmm. for her crime was um, carried around by her family, by her parents especially, and of course brothers, siblings and friends of the family. Mm -hmm. They started doing their own research in Miramar, searching for her alive. So yeah, they really carried the weight of their own if you call it an investigation, but just they really carried out the search they were on their own shoulders yeah. because of the reluctance of the police to even classify it as a, a disappearance, a missing person. Tabo Melman, the dad, the parent of um, Natalia, said that he started uh, searching the, um, the support of the media and that that made uh, some of the heads of the police actually very nervous. Even nowadays, the family says that straight away they had the feeling that the police wasn't doing as much as they should do and they were hiding something. So it was two or three days after Natalia's disappearance that Gustavo, her dad again with a friend, went to Necochea because they had the contact of a woman or a man that had a cadaver dog because they felt like they should start getting ready for the worst. for the worst, yeah. So, yeah, again, the police didn't use cadaver dogs. It was the parent of the missing girl who got Mm -hmm. it. But when he was on the way, when he was on the highway, he actually heard a news on the radio in which it says that the body of Natalia had been found Mm -hmm. in a greenhouse in Miramar, precisely. That's right. This was on February the 8th. It was in the uh, Dunicola Nursery, which is a a public space, which is... Yeah, like a small forest-like among the dunes. Yeah, kind of like an urban green space that's kind of there to... But this place actually had been already been searched before, mm. and that's why the family were feeling so weird. They found the body on Natalia, so she was murdered there. Um, when it was taken by the coroner, the autopsy indicated that uh, Natalia had bruises on her tights. She had been burned with a cigarette on her left hand. Her nose was broken and she had a strong concussion to her head. But she was actually killed by strangulation. She was strangled with her own shoelaces. Gustavo, her dad, was the first uh, relative to get to the greenhouse. Mm. Later on, Gustavo would say that he saw how the police was cutting the nails of Natalia Mm -hmm. once they got to the morgue, but he was uh, lucky enough that uh, his sister is a doctor, so she actually she was actually the person that told him that the police shouldn't do that Mm -hmm. before doing the autopsy. Yes. 
So Natalia was also sexually abused. And in the autopsy, they were found. How many different profiles of DNA on her? It was five. The Melmans had been mostly being helped in their search by the people of the city. And there was a very big rumor that turned out to be true exactly that the police were involved in that. So when the body of the younger was found that same night, mm. a whole uh, pueblada uh, happened and they actually attacked the police station of Miramar Pueblada. That would be the verb comes mm. from pueblo. Pueblo is town. So basically it's like a whole town going. And yeah. It was a riot in which most Miramar partake because it was very well known that the police would uh, stop uh, young adolescents in the streets or that they would be accomplices with the sex trafficking. Hence why when it was found out that... Um Natalia had been seen in the presence of Gustavo Fernandez, who was a known snitch, but also he was known as a fixer of young adolescent females to police. And in this case... I mean, the role that El Gallo, that Gustavo Fernandez had, according to what her family and the neighbors of Miramar said, is that he would pick adolescent girls particularly virgins, and he would kidnap them or just help the police to kidnap them and then take take them to parties in which the policemen would abuse them. Um, basically, Natalia was, uh, was one of the girls. So from this point on, it's re- this is really where forensics take over. And with such a a high profile case mm-hmm. and not to mention the entire, the entire neighborhood being on an absolute knife edge about to the whole city being on a knife edge and with emotions flaring up. The, a lot of, a lot of scrutiny was put on the proceeds of or the proceedings of the forensics. Even from the get go though, the forensic team faced a bit of an uphill battle. It was found by Natalia's father when he was on site at the greenhouse that evidence was already being tampered with. He saw a what he believed to be a forensic nurse trimming Natalia's fingernails and uh, bagging the, uh, the clippings uh, for supposedly for evidence. However, he found out later from a uh, colleague that this was not part of the procedure and that without the evidential matter, um, skin, blood, other, you know, uh, genetic material that collects under a victim's fingernails, it would make the proceeding of uh, identifying any DNA or collecting any DNA evidence that much more harder. And as such, that evidence was never admitted into court and may possibly have just vanished after that, but it was definitely not entered as evidence into the trial. So from that time on, all the evidence that was gathered for the, uh, well, that identified five separate people was from pubic hairs that were found on Natalia's body and also semen and other bodily fluids that were collected off the uh, off Natalia and and from the crime scene. To discover, to investigate the crime, Mm. they didn't use private investigators as detectives, but it was the force, the the police force of the province, they would send officers Mm. in disguise Mm. to walk around Miramar, and they would pretend to be, and this was funny, they would pretend to be uh, booksellers or Bible sellers or preachers. Like, 